We begin our discussion of T.S. Eliot's most celebrated poem, The Wasteland, published in the very important literary year of 1922, the same year James Joyce published Ulysses, uh, a couple of years after the close of World War I. Uh, the generation that Eliot was living in at the time uh, felt the malaise, disillusionment, discontentment of post-war Western civilization and he spoke to, through this poem, a generation that desperately needed definition. There was a, a purposelessness, a meaninglessness that was widely felt, a rise in youth culture that celebrated eating, drinking, and being merry, uh, right at the heart of the Jazz Age, the rise of the Jazz Age here, three years before F. Scott Fitzgerald publishes The Great Gatsby, uh, that Eliot was speaking to a group of people that had suffered uh, several losses, a uh, loss of identity, a loss of purpose, um, religious, uh, an absence of religious purpose, religious meaning. And so The Wasteland was the right poem at the right time and uh, was remarkable then, is remarkable now, and is often considered the most important poem of the 20th century. It speaks to a crisis of belief, a crisis of culture shock, uh, loss of relationships and depth and intimacy and all sorts of things in just five brief fragmented sections of this poem. But before we get into the first section, the burial of the dead, uh, it's helpful to discuss a few things on the outset, and that is uh, the title particularly. Eliot chose The Wasteland ultimately, but his first title, and the original title, was He Do the Police in Different Voices which is a quotation from a novel by Dickens where uh, a young boy reads newspaper columns and newspaper reports and does the police dialogue, the police quotations in different voices, different accents, and his caretaker uh, takes great pride in his ability to do that. Uh, but what Eliot was looking to do there with that title, it seems, is highlight the multiplicity of voices and the multiplicity of meanings that pop up in the wasteland throughout. That uh, as we go forward through the poem, uh, you'll notice a sort of babble, a Tower of Babel uh, quality to it with uh, interruptions, allusions, references to other languages, other voices without any real uh, demarcation as to when we're shifting or any real translation. Uh, Eliot just seems to be incorporating a multiplicity of voices, thoughts, ideas, changes in scenery, changes in time, uh, and it never really comes with any clear direction, that we are just given the statements, given the voices without the definitions or without any follow-up. And that might lead to uh, an understanding of how Eliot, Eliot saw his generation, that here we all are, a generation of disconnected, detached voices all speaking on top of each other, trying to come up with intimacy and communion with one another and real genuine meaning in our relationships and our existences that just might not be there any longer. Again, this is uh, written a couple of years after uh, World War I, the war to end all wars, the Great War, um, that that conflict and the ambiguity of it, the massive destruction of it, marked a real tangible shift in how people viewed themselves, viewed each other, and viewed their lives. Uh, the, three great, the three great questions of where do I come from, why am I here, and where am I going, all suddenly became unanswerable in this life and in this reality. So we start then with the epigraph here, which if you'll notice just in, in looking at it, Already we have four different languages represented. So this, spe this speaks to the different voices that his original title uh, hinted at. That already, just in the dedication here, we have the quote and then the dedication to Ezra Pound. There are four languages represented. You have Latin, Greek, English, and Italian. So already the jumbling, fragmented, confusing nature, challenging nature of the poem is presented. But it's helpful to, s to know what the epigraph is asking us to see as far as setting the tone for the poem. The epigraph uh, can be loosely translated. He says, 
uh, the quote says, now I, now I myself with my own eyes saw the sibyl of Cumai hanging in a jar. And when the boys said to her, what do you want? She replied, I want to die. Now this is an important um, mythological illusion here. The sibyl of Cumai was a seer a prophetess that was presented with a request, a, a wish, so to speak, and what she wished for was eternal life. So she wishes for eternal life and is granted it, but she neglected to request for eternal youth. So what you have is the Sibyl who is given eternal life, but is condemned or cursed with eternal aging. So after years and years and years of life and eternal age, she has shriveled, she has become decayed, and she has become uh, antiquated to the point where she's shriveled and she's hanging in a jar. And these boys come in and ask her what she wants. And her reply is that she wants to die. And that presents a tone to the poem that is worth picking up, and that is the prospect of death as something to be desired. That in this wasteland that we live in, with no real truth, no real purpose, no real meaning, perhaps death is desirable. Perhaps death presents the one way out of all of this pain and emptiness and barrenness that the wasteland presents. That that is the only real hope um, for peace, for comfort, for silence amid all the multiple voices, all of the white noise, all of the emptiness of our relationships and our careers and our ultimate existences that she has eternal life, something that looks desirable, that looks wonderful, but she does not have eternal youth, that her life, of this eternal life she's been granted, really is just a steady decline into further corruption, decay, corroding, uh, and aging. And so we begin with the poem. First section is titled The Burial of the Dead, and there are five sections in the wasteland, and You'll note in each section that Eliot hints at uh, a major element to, that coincides with each of the sections. You have earth, air, fire, water, and then spirit being that fifth element that is rather undefinable, but uh, felt, but knowable. And so the burial of the dead here presents that first element of earth. The burial of the dead, of course, describing uh, interring dead bodies into the earth, into the soil, uh, the soil from which we were generated, the dust-to-dust dust concept from Genesis, uh, that we are dust, that we were scooped up as a handful of dust by God, breathed into with the breath of life, and then we return to dust when we die. That central element pops up throughout this first section, and it's worth noting. Uh, but the burial of the dead, the phrase itself, comes from the uh, Book of Common Prayer, which is a book, a uh, sacred book used in most Anglican churches that describes uh, the ceremony, the order of service for the right, proper burial of, of dead saints. And the, the Book of Common Prayer specifically references a passage from John, from uh, John 11, that describes the reality of death, but also the prospect of life after death, or eternal life, or in this sense, a rebirth. That Christians are given a proper burial, that we are given life, we move into death, but then we have the prospect of a rebirth, or life after death, that we look to, that we look forward to. It's our final hope is in Christ. And that passage from John 11 Jesus is speaking and he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Uh, the one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me 
will never die. And so Jesus presents the concept that all, all sinners, all saints must die, but then there's a, a, a resurrection. That if you die in Christ, you are resurrected in Christ. That if you die outside of Christ, there is no prospect of, of renewal or rebirth or resurrection. And, I, and that presents itself in a sort of irony, uh, as we see in the wasteland itself, that what if there is no prospect of rebirth? What if there is no fertile soil from which anything that is buried could be regrown? You think of the image of a seed that is sown into the ground, that it is buried, it is sown into the soil, into the earth, but it's sown into the earth with the prospect of renewal the hope of rebirth or resurrection, that something more glorious, something better, will rise out of the soil. Eliot takes that point to say, well, what if it ends simply in a burial? What if the dead simply go into the earth and there is no prospect of renewal? There is no prospect of rebirth. So now we go into the poem proper. Eliot says, April is the cruelest month, breeding lilacs out of the dead land, mixing memory and desire, stirring dull roots with spring rain. It's his first sentence, uh, and already we have a reference to another work of literature from centuries before, The Canterbury Tales by Geoffrey Chaucer. is alluded to here in this opening line when Eliot says, April is the cruelest month. Now that's unusual because April... typically refers to the myth or even the archetype of spring and reawakening or renewal. And we tend to see the same thing, that we have the season of winter, which is cold, barren, stark, the season of death, where all things die, hibernate, are enclosed for the cold months. And then April brings about the mating season, the season of renewal and reawakening where the the air gets warm again the flowers bloom the grass grows april and spring itself presents a reawakening from the death imagery of the death archetype that winter brings so april ought not to be the cruelest month it ought to be the month of most hope and optimism yet eliot says april's the cruelest month so already we're operating with a pretty heavy sense of irony here but the allusion to the Canterbury Tales, the reference here, the Canterbury Tales was one of the most profound, uh, significant works of uh, the Middle Ages in England, and it presents a pilgrimage that several different citizens of England take toward a holy place in Canterbury, uh, toward the Archbishop in Canterbury. And the way the Canterbury Tales begins is with a similar description of April, yet what Chaucer writes in the Canterbury Tales is, he begins saying, when April with its sweet showers has pierced the drought of March. And he goes on and ultimately concludes his sentence saying, then the people long to go on pilgrimages. So in Chaucer, he sees April as the time when sweet showers pierce the drought. The April brings the rain and, and the right seasoning, the right temperatures for the dead things to grow again that it pierces the drought of March, and it's in that season that people long to go on pilgrimages, people long to go back outside and to go on quests and to go on adventures. Yet Eliot says, April's the cruelest month. And here's why he says it's the cruelest month. April breeds lilacs out of dead land, which is not really possible. There's a paradox there. He says April breeds lilacs out of dead land. Uh, there's something going on there. He says, April mixes memory and desire, stirring dull roots with spring rain. So there's our uh, reference to Chaucer again, that spring rain does come, but the problem is, in the wasteland that we live in, all roots are dull, all land is dead, and nothing can grow from it. There is no prospect of rebirth any longer. We have an absence of God, an absence of religious meaning, an absence of purpose, brought on by several different factors of modern life, that modern life does not present 
any real prospect of resurrection anymore. That people are simply people. They are dust to dust. They will simply be buried. And in this dead wasteland that we live in, the spring rain that does come mixes and breeds and stirs dull roots. So it comes, but there's nothing really it can do to awaken anything any longer. And Eliot presents two key features here, memory and desire that are mixed. Which is interesting, the memory is a memory of a better time. What we might call nostalgia. A longing for the way things were. A longing for a time when things were simpler, when, when death had a prospect of rebirth, when faith and religion and the imagination and our heart's hopes taught us that there was something that we would be awakened to. There was an ultimate glory we could look forward to. So memory of those better times mixes with desire, which is a forward-looking idea, the desire for something better to come. Which ironically will not happen in the wasteland we live in. That the memory of a time before the desolation we live in now perhaps a pre-war era, a time when things were simpler, a time when perhaps childhood or the purity of innocence was not lost. So that memory of those better times mixes with the desire for something better to come, perhaps even a homecoming, a time when we could return to the way things were. Yet Eliot says those things are mixed and stirred and bred by the rain that comes, but it only lands on dull roots and dead land. So thus, April is a cruel month. It brings the rain, it brings the warmth, it brings all of the conditions for growth, rebirth, resurrection, without the real prospect of it. And that's the tantalizing idea here, that we live constantly as human beings in the wasteland with a desire for rebirth, a desire for heaven, a desire for an eternal prospect of glory and beauty, and the memory of a time when those things answered our questions, when those ideas satisfied, and yet in this wasteland, there are only dull roots. There is only dead land. There is nothing that could present us any real possibility that what we thought could happen or what we think can happen actually will. He says, winter kept us warm, continuing that, paradox, that paradox. Winter kept us warm, covering earth in forgetful snow. A sort of numbing agent. Or a paralyzing agent, causing forgetfulness. That winter was warm. It covered everything with forgetful snow. It's spring that's cruel. Spring that strips away all of the cold comfort we had. All of the things that kept us from remembering what rebirth and growth looked like and felt like. That it was in winter that we could paralyze and numb any feelings of memory and desire and just simply exist. But it's April that strips away those numbing agents. It strips away forgetful snow and exposes the wasteland for what it truly is. A desolate land with no prospect of growth. Feeding a little life with dried tubers. Again, more uh, paradoxical language. How can dried tubers feed a little life? It doesn't. It, all it does is feed the dream of something occurring that in reality cannot occur. But here at this line, we have our, uh, a voice shift here, that this first uh, grouping of lines seems to be a philosophical, intellectual uh, study of the wasteland, the modern era we live in. Now we have a much more descriptive, much more specific memory, a much more specific scene and it seems like we have a female voice here from later lines. It seems to be the voice of nobility, probably a princess of some kind, Princess Marie, as we see here. Um, and this may be a time, you see the past tense already, summer surprised us. We moved from April is the cruelest month to summer surprised us. A look at the, the past here. This might be a memory of a pre-war time of... of uh, innocence, loveliness, order, uh, sensibility, before all of the disruption and chaos of war. 
and the resulting aftermath in the wasteland. But she says, summer surprised us coming over the Starnberger See, a river in Germany, with a shower of rain. So here we have the rain coming again, yet this time it's not presented in any irony. It's coming with the summer months, the height of youth and the height of loveliness. A shower of rain we stopped, so there we have two people together, uh, not the loneliness and isolation we see all throughout the wasteland, but now we have camaraderie and friendship. We stopped in the colonnade and went on in sunlight into the Hof Garden and drank coffee and talked for an hour. Now, this language is fundamentally different. This looks like communion, human communion and interaction. Joy, innocence. Look what's described. Summer in a shower of rain. We stopped in the colonnade and went on in sunlight. Not dull grayness, but in sunlight into the Hof Garden to drink coffee and talk for an hour. Seems to be even an intimate interaction. And notice this next line. Here's that multiplicity of voices, right? We have a German interruption that basically translates to say, I'm not a Russian, I'm a Lithuanian, a true German. Uh, it seems to be a, an interrupting voice that is overheard at this discussion in the Hof Garden, this communion between these two people, talking and drinking coffee. And, and then, out of nowhere, we have this abrupt, jarring, disrupting intrusion of a separate voice and a separate language. So again, that Tower of Babel concept that we can't stay on a fixed memory until another voice interrupts and jars our line of thinking. And notice what the line says. It's a statement of identity and validation. I am not this. I am this, a true German. I'm not Russian. I'm a true German, spoken in German. So even that one sentence as intruding on Marie's memory is itself a statement for assurance. That I am this. I, I truly am a, a true German. And we pick back up with Marie's narrative here. And when we were children, again, the innocence of childhood, as something that has been lost, it's the memory. That it's the memory is all she has. And when we were children, staying at the Archduke's, my cousins, the hint that she is perhaps uh, of royalty or nobility herself, her cousin is an Archduke, he took me out on a sled and I was frightened. He said, Marie, Marie, hold on tight. And down we went. Now that's important because this memory provides an emotional tone that we, of course we haven't seen yet, that really uh, brings about an idea of safety, security, uh, assurance, confidence that we just don't have anymore in the wasteland. This memory, Marie is going down on a sled and is frightened. So she tells us that she's nervous and anxious about the road ahead, the adventure ahead, perhaps even life itself, that she's frightened, as she should be. It's a downward slope. Yet for her, she was not alone as so many in the wasteland, as we come to see it, will be. She's not isolated. She's not alone. There is a man to go down with her, to comfort her. And he does comfort her. He says, Marie, Marie, hold on tight. He gives her something to hold on to. And down we went. Again, the we there, that she has somebody to go through life together. Both its joys, uh, laughing and drinking coffee in the Hof Garden, and its frights, going down the slope on a sled at high speeds, danger ahead, obstacles ahead. He assures her, hold on tight, and down we went. So here's that memory again of the way things were, the kind of life they had, without any real prospect of having it any longer. In the mountains, there you feel free. And yet now, she says, I read, back to the present tense, much of the night. Perhaps a sense of insomnia. I read much of the night and go south in the winter. The, the escape from winter hinted at again. 
that winter brings danger and harshness and we must try to escape from that. But notice too, at the end of this, she's alone again. She doesn't spend her nights in a warm bed with a husband. Uh, she's, she's not in communion any longer. Her voice ends here with her saying, I, in solitude, read much of the night. Don't no peaceful sleep, no comfort, nobody to share it with. And she goes south in the winter. So now we shift back to that beginning voice, the more detached, intellectual, philosophical voice. And it reads, What are the roots that clutch? What branches grow out of this stony rubbish? And we need to pause here because we have some biblical references going on. Uh, Jesus himself is described in Isaiah in uh, prophecy as the root out of dry ground. And here the speaker is saying, what are the roots that can clutch? Where are the roots that can grab hold to something in this dead land and grow? What branches grow out of this stony rubbish? Again, Jesus is referred to as the branch in the New Testament. So you have an Old Testament and a New Testament reference to Christ as the root out of dry ground and the branch. In John 15, he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. All hinting at this idea of growth through a Savior, growth through a Messiah figure, someone who can assure us there's nothing to fear, someone whom we can hold on tight to. Yet the speaker is saying, what are the roots that clutch? What branches grow out of the stony rubbish? And there's no answer. There is no root, there is no branch that can grow out of the wasteland. Son of man, it says, you cannot say or guess. And we need to pause here. The phrase Son of Man is often a phrase that refers to Christ himself in the New Testament, that he is called the Son of Man. But it's also a phrase out of Ezekiel that refers to simply the prophet, that God calls Ezekiel Son of Man. In Ezekiel 36 and 37, Ezekiel 2, he uses that sort of language to refer to the prophet himself. And it's interesting here that we have the address to a prophet, Son of Man, comma, Yet, the statement seems entirely contrary to the role of a prophet. Son of man, you cannot say or guess. So those we once trusted to be able to tell us, or at least uh, assume for us, what the roots are that can clutch. What is the truth? As Pilate would ask, what is truth? What are the roots that clutch? Here we have our, our response. You cannot say or guess, for you know only a heap of broken images. And there's a motif that Eliot we, uh, weaves throughout these five sections of fragmentation itself. We have the fragmentation of voices, where there's no clear, sustained narrative. We just have a jumble of different voices speaking at different con different times. The poem itself is fragmented into five sections. Um, and here, all we know is a heap of broken images, a pile of brokenness. It seems to remind of Ezekiel 37, where God brings Ezekiel to the valley of dry bones, just this valley of deadness and broken images piled on top of each other. This is the wasteland in which we live. There is no sustained meaning. There is no water. There is nothing that can bring life to this dead land. It's simply a heap of broken images where the sun beats and the dead tree gives no shelter. The cricket, no relief. No sweetness. Music shelter or shade. We are exposed for what we truly are without any real hope for comfort or shelter or growth. 
and the dry stone, no sound of water, again the music there, no, not even an echo, not even a hope of water, only, there's that repetition again in this, this word at the end of the line here, this is what we know, a heap of broken images, and he says, only there is shadow under this red rock. Come in under the shadow of this red rock. The Eliot and the speaker in this poem presents the one real comfort in the present. And he contrasts them from both the past and the future. He says, I will show you something different. Something modern. Something altogether new. Different from either your shadow at morning striding behind you, the past, the shadow at morning, behind you, or your shadow at evening, rising to meet you, future, evening. He says, I will show you something altogether different. He says, I will show you fear in a handful of dust. So the present is where we must reside. Because the past is memory of a better time, which you cannot repeat, you cannot go back to. And the future is desire for a time that may yet come, yet is not guaranteed or even hoped for with any sense of reality. He says, I will show you fear. What stands between memory and desire? Fear in a handful of dust. This is the burial of the dead. It's dust to dust. He says, I will not show you anything in the past that you can return to. There is nothing in the past that can provide any comfort. And there's nothing in the future that can provide any comfort. All of it is in shadow. Your shadow at morning, your shadow at evening, he says, I will show you fear in a handful of dust. As Shakespeare mentioned in Hamlet, man is a quintessence of dust. That you see a reduction, and possibly even a trivializing, of humanity and all of its complexity, the matters of the soul, the, the ideas of faith and an afterlife, and the image of God being born in all men. The stark reality, the only thing we know, there is no root that can clutch, there is no branch that can grow. The only thing we know, the broken images we know, is the shadow in our past, the shadow in our future, and the handful of dust that defines our existence in the present.